Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service here this evening at the Tron. It's good to see you, and uh, if you're visiting with us, then you're, you're very welcome indeed. There'll be opportunity after the formal part of the service. There'll be refreshments served upstairs and downstairs. Do stay behind if you can, and uh, take the opportunity to encourage one another in the Lord Jesus. We're going to begin by singing. you find it in these blue books at number 196. Number 196, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh my soul, praise him, for he is your health and salvation. Number 196. as we sit let's join our hearts in prayer let's pray the psalmist says praise the Lord praise the Lord O my soul 
I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. And so, Lord, we do bow before you alone in praise this night as we gather before you in the name of your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit reign forever over all things and are our God and our Savior. And we rejoice, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us as the true God, the only God, the creator of everything, the sustainer of all this world and the judge of all this world who will judge all people with your perfect justice. And therefore, how thankful we are that you have revealed yourself to us also as the Savior as the one in whom alone can be found salvation from a judgment that is real and terrible and lasting and eternal. But you came to save us because you so loved us and you shed your own blood that we might be saved from the consequences of our sins, our rebellions, all that should rightly separate us from you forever and ever not because of anything we had done, not because of anything in us at all, but because of the sheer depth of mercy and love in your heart. So, Lord, as we gather in, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge our extraordinary debt of gratitude to you. We rejoice in your great salvation. We long to live in a manner worthy of the calling, the great calling that we've received to be your people, to tell forth the praises of your name, to show this world your greatness and your glory, and to share with them also your mercy, your compassion, your great grace, which beckons sinful people to come home to where we belong, to what we were created for, to be your holy people, wholesome, whole, truly human, reflecting your own glory and goodness and beauty and love. We only have to say these things, Lord, to realize just how far short we fall. Still, every one of us, even those who name your name, those of us who have followed Jesus Christ, your Son, for all of our lives, for decades. Yet still we know, perhaps now more than ever before, the longer we follow you, just how unworthy we are of you and your great name. And so we still need you, Lord. We need your fresh cleansing grace every single day. Every time we gather together here, week by week, we find ourselves coming before you with confession of all that we have done in this past week that we ought not to have done, all that we haven't done we should have done, the things we've said that are unworthy of us, never mind unworthy of you and your name, the torrent of things that we've thought that have gone through our minds that come not from the grace of heaven, but from the pit of hell, from our enemy who so loves to stir up the remnants of sin in these sinful bodies. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. 
Cleanse us afresh. Assure us again of your great and lasting forgiveness. And renew us. Renew us afresh within by your Holy Spirit, stirring up to life within us. Your life that is planted deep in our hearts. Stir up a desire for you and a love for you. And therefore a love for one another and a love for your gospel and a love for this world. That our eyes might see what your eyes see. And our ears hear what your ears hear. And the cries of a world desperate for light, walking in darkness, confusion and pain. So help us, Lord, to be your people of light. People who shine that light and who share your life in every way that we can think of, every opportunity that we have with all of our strength and with all of our might. Help us, Lord, more and more to be a people who are worthy of your name. So, Father, we gather tonight once again in your presence to seek your face. Hear us and answer us, we pray. Feed us in your holy word and send us on our way strengthened and resolute to be steadfast for our Lord Jesus Christ every day of this coming week. Whatever it holds, whatever challenges we face, strengthen us for his sake, we pray. And we ask it in his name. Amen. If you uh, were with us this morning, you will have probably picked up one of these uh, notice sheets. If not, they're on the tables outside. Do pick one up on your way out. There are a number of things there that you need. One is uh, the monthly prayer update with a lovely picture of the Robri family in Jos, Nigeria. Do take that. It's the details of uh, particular things they're asking us to pray for this month. And I'm sure we want to encourage them as we do that together. Also, there are uh, in the sheets and also in the racks outside lots of these lovely cards, Easter cards. There's one uh, card for each of the venues. They're, they're the same on the outside, but uh, on the back they um, emphasize more particularly the different events that are going on in the different buildings. Do take these and use them. We have absolutely loads of them. So they're for you to take and use as invitations for friends and neighbors and others for the Mark drama, for the Easter services and so on. Uh, let's make the most of these opportunities. Christmas and Easter are great times, aren't they, when people uh, are perhaps willing to come to church when they wouldn't think about it at other times. And uh, it's a great opportunity for us to do that. So let's not miss these chances that the Lord gives us. And we've made these cards just so we can do that. And uh, they're out there, and I hope you'll take some away uh, afterwards. A couple of other things just to highlight in the notices. Uh, this coming Saturday, there are still places available for the Cornhill Scotland uh, his Word in My Hands Day. It's a day of Bible teaching, uh, particularly aimed at those who are involved in any way in, in teaching the Bible to others, even if it's just reading the Bible with a friend uh, or with a neighbor. It'll be a really helpful day for you. The focus is going to be on looking at the, the uh, epistles, the New Testament letters. So how do you, how do you go about uh, understanding the message of a, a New Testament letter and helping somebody else to, to understand it? That's what it's going to be about. Uh, Andy Gemmell and Peter Dixon are going to be speaking at that, and uh, you're very welcome to come along uh, and book in. You can book through the uh, Cornhill website, uh, and uh, if you're a student, I think you can come for free, but you do have to book, and uh, that helps them to, to know who to, uh, to look out for. Well, I'll leave you to read the rest of these notices. Do pick them up and uh, use them. They'll help you with your prayers, and they'll help you to know what's going on in the life of the church, and that's important for all of us. We're going to sing again before Paul comes to read, and you'll see it on the screens, uh, a song all about faith and seeing the hand of God working in creation and all through history. By faith, we see the hand of God.
Good. We turn now to God's words, and we're in the book of Revelation, and chapter 2. And we're in the letter to the church in Thyatira. So chapter 2, verse 18. I don't have the church Bible number in front of me, but 1029. So if you've got the church Bible, 1029. Revelation 2, verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, and faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter days, your latter works, exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you, in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, our Lord, as we've seen in this passage, has eyes like flames of fire. He sees all. And he sees into your heart and mine. And so our next hymn, number 139, speaks to that. You, O Lord, have searched and know me. You know when I sit or rise. Every thought and deed lies open to your all-perceiving eyes. Number 139.
musicians will play for us, and as that's happening, the offering will be uplifted. And perhaps as that's going on, you might want to read again those words from Revelation uh, chapter 2. But the offering for the Lord's work will now be uplifted. Let's pray. And as we do so, I'll use the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. As we come to God's word, we sing uh, the hymn from our hymn books. Number 534, on this assembled host, in this accepted hour, O Spirit, as at Pentecost, descend in all your power. Number 534.
Well, please do turn back to the passage we read a bit earlier in Revelation chapter 2 and this letter to the church in Thyatira. The Lord Jesus Christ is jealous for his church. Each of these seven letters is written with the aim of helping and encouraging the churches which he loves to grow and hold firm and remain faithful. The Lord Jesus, have we seen, walks amongst his churches, tending to them, nurturing them. He sees his churches for what they truly are. He knows them as they really are. And so he knows what they need to be told. And that means bringing words of encouragement, but also words of sharp rebuke. Difficult, hard, bold words, like the words in our passage this evening in this letter to the church in Thyatira. Can you imagine the chap who carried this letter, which we now know as the letter of Revelation, the book of Revelation, this series of letters to the seven churches. Can you imagine him as he's been delivering this round the different churches as he closes in on Thyatira? He's read the letter. He knows what's to come. He knows that it is a letter that is going to expose a certain Jezebel. She's going to be exposed for who she truly is. He knows there's going to be significant fallout He knows it's likely to be messy, but he goes. The letter is delivered. The letter is read out to the church. And it is not a comfortable read, is it? For this is the Lord Jesus Christ who searches minds and hearts. His eyes are like flames of fire. He sees what is really going on, and he's prepared to say what his people perhaps are not prepared to say. It's a stern letter, isn't it, as we read through it. So we'll look at this under three points. First, churches that are growing can still have serious blind spots. Second, churches must not tolerate people within the church who seduce others into sin. And thirdly, Churches that hold firm to Jesus until the end will inherit the earth. So then, first, churches that are growing can still have serious blind spots. As with each of the letters we've seen so far, this letter begins with words of commendation from the Lord. And they are high praise indeed, aren't they? Look what Jesus says about this church, verse 19, I know your works, your love and faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. This church in Thyatira, it is a church marked by real growth in the gospel. Love, faith, service, patient endurance. All marks of this church, and they are making real progress. Their latter works exceed their works at the start. And that's in real contrast to the church in Ephesus we saw a few weeks ago, which had abandoned what they were at first. Ephesus was a a church strong on doctrine, but really quite weak on devotion. The opposite is true here in Thyatira. Thyatira, in contrast, is a church growing and making progress. It is a church strong on devotion, The Lord Jesus knows it, and he commends them for it. Now, these are good things. These are things the Lord Jesus wants to see in every church. And Thyatira is to keep going at these things, to keep growing, to keep growing in their devotion of him. But there is a danger in amongst all that growth. The fact that the church there was making progress did not mean that all was well. Growth in itself can lull a congregation into a false sense of security. 
it can be very tempting to think, can't it, that the mere fact of growth means there can't be any major issues going on. If there are real problems, we wouldn't be growing. Some may have reasoned. But churches that are growing can have serious blind spots. And that's true in all sorts of avenues of life, isn't it? Overall growth can hide disturbing realities that are easily overlooked or ignored because, well, things are growing. Think about a business, for example. Excellent growth. The bottom line is very healthy indeed. But there is a key person high up in the organization who's really a bit of a bully and has made life miserable for their team, the team they manage. Now, left unchecked, the bulk of his high-quality team will leave the business, and that will, in the end, be reflected in the bottom line. The organization's leaders didn't tackle this individual either because they hadn't been paying attention or because the big picture was just so rosy. They didn't want the hassle of dealing with this particular individual and all the fallout that would inevitably bring. It's true in business. So, too, with churches. The general picture can be very positive. The works, love and faith and service and patient endurance and latter works exceeding the first all paint a very positive picture of growth. But real and significant issues are not tackled, either because growth has distracted the attention of the church or because there's been an unwillingness to tackle real problems. Certain issues have been tolerated foolishly. And that seems to be the situation here in Thyatira. Great growth, lots of positives. But as with so many of these letters, there is a significant but that follows these words of praise. No different here in Thyatira. Great praise and progress, but there's a but. There are issues in that church that, if unaddressed, will undo all the growth. So let's look on then to that problem, our second point. Churches must not tolerate people within the church who seduce others into sin. The church there in Thyatira was in real danger. Despite great growth, they were tolerating a particular individual within the church, and that posed a real danger. They tolerated a person they ought not to have tolerated. This was a church abounding in devotion, but lacking in discernment. So who was this woman? What had she done? Well, look at verse 20. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, And is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. People in the church, it seems, were engaging in the similar sorts of behavior as we saw last week in Pergamon. Sexual morality and idolatry. But the difference here in Thyatira is the source of the problem. Here in Thyatira, it wasn't so much external pressure, but rather an insidious influence within. It was an individual within the church that was ruining others. They were tolerating a Jezebel. Now, that could have been her actual name, but at the very least, it's a clear reference to their Old Testament villainess. In the 9th century BC, Jezebel was an unbelieving princess from Sidon whom Israel's king Ahab had married for political reasons. She brought with her false gods, and soon lots of pagan priests had spread the worship of Baal and Asherah through the land. God's people were seduced by the idea that these Sidonian gods would bring economic prosperity. And so Jezebel's idolatry involving ritual prostitution and pagan shrines swept the land. And the fact that Jesus uses the same name for this woman here in Thyatira 
And what he goes on to say about what she was doing indicates the sort of woman that this was. This second Jezebel encouraged Christians to engage in the ceremonies and feasts that were so much part and parcel of economic life there in Thyatira. Thyatira was a a fairly small town, but known for its many trade guilds. And if you wanted to get on in economic life with those trade guilds, you had to throw your lot in with all that went with it. Pagan rituals, all these sorts of immoralities and idolatries. And this participation that Jezebel was pushing and urging, well, it included, as we see there, sexual immorality and idolatry. And this Jezebel seems to have seduced Christians in the church to believe that their faith in Christ didn't exclude them from the trade guild idolatries that would guarantee them economic well-being. She said, you can have it all. You can remain a Christian, but throw your lot in with these trade guilds and all that goes with it. Seductive message for those Christians there in Thyatira. You can have it both ways. You can enjoy all the benefits of being in Christ while fully engaging in these pagan rituals. It was a dangerous message, and it sucked in Christians in the church. And this was deadly serious, as the Lord Jesus goes on to demonstrate. The actions Jesus promises to take just show how serious it is. What does Jesus say he will do to her and those who follow her? Well, look on, verse 21. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual morality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. The Lord Jesus has been patient with this Jezebel. He's given her time to repent. And that is the grace of God, isn't it? He is gracious and patient. He does give time for his wayward people, for wayward individuals to repent, to return to him. But there does come a time when he says, No longer, no longer will I wait. Now, this Jezebel had had time. We're not told how long, but she's had time and she's refused to repent. And the Lord Jesus promises to throw her onto a sickbed. Now, let's be clear what this is and isn't saying. This is not saying that those who find themselves on a sickbed are automatically there because they behaved in Jezebel's sorts of ways. The vast majority of sickness and pain we endure in this world is because we live in this world, a fallen world, a world full of suffering and under the curse. Now, some suffering experience is, of course, due to our own foolish decisions, but most of it is due to the fact we live in this world. But what this is saying is that sometimes, sometimes the Lord will bring someone down He will bring them to their sickbed because of unrepentant and destructive sin, sin that threatens his church. He will bring them down in order to protect his church, the church for which he died. So this judgment on Jezebel, it is retributive. That is, it is a genuine punishment on Jezebel and others who refuse to repent but it's also protective. Jezebel and her followers represented a deadly influence on others in the church. And so the Lord will remove that influence if he needs to. But it also serves as a deterrent to others. Look on to the next sentence there in verse 23. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Word would have got around, not least because this very letter would have been read out in all the churches. People would have heard about Jezebel, what happened to her. 
that Jesus is not going to be taken for a fool. He will know and take action when those threaten his church. The seriousness of the punishment illuminates and reveals the seriousness of the sin. Jezebel was herself engaging it, but also encouraging others to partake in. The implicit warning to others as they saw what happened to her, as they read what happened, the implicit warning is stay clear of Jezebel's in your own church. If you have people like this, stay clear. And if you realize you've been sucked in, then repent right away. Repent. Two implications under our second point before we look at our final point. Two implications. First, beware the self-appointed. Beware the self-appointed. Did you notice, as we're looking through the text there, that this Jezebel, she's self-appointed. She calls herself a prophetess. And in claiming to be a prophetess, she was claiming to be the mouthpiece of God. Come listen to me. This is what God is saying. Now, no doubt she was an articulate and persuasive woman a powerful woman, but her authority is self-assigned and it's leading others into sin. Her teaching was perverting God's right ordering of the world, wasn't it? She was encouraging idolatry, worshipping created things rather than creator, sexual immorality, sexual activity outside God's ordering of sex within marriage. She was encouraging both these things. Now, Christ's church does not recognize self-appointed leaders. So don't be taken in by them. Be slow to trust such people. Rather, trust those appointed by others. Take our church, for example. The church is led by those who have been set apart by others, by ordained ministers and leaders, who've been recognized and set apart by others, by, in our case, the Didasco Presbytery. So those ordained ministers are accountable to the presbytery. And so if any of us step out of line and start, for example, teaching the things that Jezebel was teaching, well, they can and should and must be removed. Our authority will be removed by those who put us in that place in the first place. The self-appointed has no such accountability or authority. So be very careful with such self-appointed prophets who promise great insights, who promise new and exciting truths and teachings, people who say you can have it all, who say you can be a faithful Christian whilst embracing the world's idolatries, whilst enjoying sexual morality. Be wary of such people. But the problem is, of course, that very often... It is the very people who should be guarding a church against such things that actually promote these things. Ordained ministers who promote sexual immorality and are happy to condone whatever new perversion the media elite is pushing. According to the latest best film at the Oscars, that's bestiality. And given enough time, the churches that have towed the line on same-sex marriage will tow the line on that, I suspect, even that. Just read the National Church's guidance on transgender issues published this week to get a sense of what ordained ministers are promoting. So yes, beware of the self-appointed, but be discerning too of those appointed by others. So that's the first implication. Second, beware tolerating what shouldn't be tolerated. Remember, that Jesus' rebuke here is primarily aimed at the church, not Jezebel. Yes, Jesus unmasks Jezebel and details what she's been doing and the consequences of that for her and others if they refuse to repent. But Jesus takes issue with the church's toleration of her. Look at verse 20. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman. That's the issue. It's their toleration of her. So the implication here is that there are people and teachings that the church 
shouldn't tolerate. And through a failure to tackle Jezebel, this church was in effect endorsing her teaching. How absolutely devastating for those in the church. Now as a church, we must tolerate a lot. We must tolerate each other. That's quite something, isn't it? We're to put up with people that annoy us, who we don't naturally get on with, who we disagree with on certain issues. But we don't tolerate indiscriminately. It is not blanket toleration. And that seems to be what has happened in Thyatira. Anything goes. But that is wrong. There are some things that we cannot tolerate. Someone claiming to speak for God, who draws others into idolatry and sexual immorality, cannot be tolerated. So we need to be willing to be discerning, to discriminate. Don't tolerate what shouldn't be tolerated. And that can be uncomfortable. It might mean challenging people, perhaps in public ways. But sometimes that must be done. It was the case with Jezebel. It will be the case time to time in our church. So do not tolerate what shouldn't be tolerated. Well, there's two implications under that second point. Let's look thirdly now to our final point. Churches that hold firm to Jesus until the end will inherit the earth. Jezebel urged the church that were in Thyatira to compromise in order to win temporary acceptance amongst the trade guilds and temporary economic benefit. In contrast, Jesus urges the church to stand firm and so inherit the whole earth forever. This is mind-blowing stuff, isn't it? Jesus says to his church, hold firm. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't tolerate Jezebel. Keep at the main things, and I will give you authority over the nations. That's what he says there, isn't it? Verse 25 and 26. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Jesus draws back the curtains. And again, he shows us the big picture. He shows us where history is heading. And it is truly mind-blowing. Jesus is one day going to be given authority over the nations, and his people, his church, will join with him in that reign. It's language here that draws heavily on Psalm 2, a psalm about the foolish rebellion of the world's kings against the king of the universe, who will one day bring about the consummation of his kingdom. And that kingdom, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, it does not come because the world welcomes his reign and evolves into the kingdom of God, no. But it comes because Christ imposes his reign by force on rebellious people. So you can either be with me, says Jesus, and reign with me over the nations, or you can reject me, refusing to repent like Jezebel. So fighting now for what is right, refusing to tolerate the Jezebels within the church now, will be worth it one day. His sovereignty over every nation and every person will one day be fully visible, fully realized. But for now, as we wait for that day, we declare his sovereignty and urge people, appeal to people, command people to submit to his rule today, whilst they still can, whilst God is patient, to call out a Jezebel in the church. To refuse to tolerate someone like that in a church, that's not a comfortable thing to do, is it? She was, in all likelihood, a very formidable woman with a considerable following within the congregation. But to challenge her, to cease tolerating her, that would undoubtedly lead to fallout and mess. But do we see the seriousness of what she was really doing? It was so serious that Jesus was going to step in himself 
and take action if the church didn't. He would strike her down and strike her children dead. Serious matters, aren't they? Serious because eternal matters, matters of eternity are in the balance. The consequences of leaving a Jezebel unchallenged are far, far more serious than having to deal with a few unhappy and angry members of the church. So the Lord Jesus would urge his church today, he would urge you, if you find yourself in a place with a Jezebel, don't tolerate it. Stand firm with Jesus because it will be worth it in the end. That is why he includes these verses at the end of this section, this letter. He shows them what's coming. He shows them it'll be worth it. Eternity is in view. Stand firm with Jesus. It will be worth it in the end. And he will give to those who stand firm. He will give the morning star, his very self, the Son of God, the King of the universe, Lord of the nations. He will give himself to those who stand firm, who refuse to tolerate what should not be tolerated. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father God, you know your people. You have eyes like a flame of fire. And Lord, you see through all that we do, you know our hearts, you know your churches. And Lord, you are jealous for your church. And Lord, you will do what is required to keep your church safe and growing. So Lord, please help us to take our part, to heed these words, these hard words, that we would be a people willing to discriminate, willing to not tolerate those who should not be tolerated. Give us courage so that your church, your people, may grow in devotion, may grow without hindrance in your works, your love, your faith, your service, your patient endurance, and that we be a people who grow and stand firm in you. Help us, Lord, to do that. Help us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we close our time by singing our final hymn number 854. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be his helpers, others' lives to bring? So let's sing together as we close. Number five, eight, five, four, eight, five, four.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.